A new report out this week takes a snapshot of Canada's economy, and the picture is bleak. Among the findings, the economy not only stalled in 2023, it contracted on a per capita basis. And the GDP per capita fell faster than any time in at least six decades. The authors found the growth in Canada's clean technology a disturbing development. And Canada's business R&D hovered at about 0.6% of GDP last year, which they say is little change from 2022. Former Conservative Cabinet Minister Lisa Raitt and former Liberal Cabinet Minister Anne McClellan co-chair the Coalition for a Better Future, and they join me now. It's good to see you both again. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Great David. to see you. So, Lisa, you flagged concerns last year for more urgency in decisions yeah. by policymakers, and this year the report says those worries are even heightened, more heightened. Why? What's happening? There. Well, I think what you're seeing is that we still don't have the fundamental basics in place to talk about long-term economic growth that's actually working. So we take a look at these 21 KPIs, these metrics, on an annual basis. We've been doing this since 2021 when we started the endeavor. And we had hoped that we would see tracking going up. And we're actually a lot surprised that we're seeing tracking going in the wrong direction, given that other countries are tracking up in areas in which we should be doing better. So for us, that means that there's a problem. But it's not for us to suggest what the solution is. What we say then is, look, policymakers, here's the evidence as to why this isn't working. You really should go and take a second look at what your policies are. But there is one mm. policy we agree on that does have to be dealt with, and that is the regulatory regime. Right. And that will help people invest in Canada because it's the number one impediment to getting more business investment here. Okay, so KPI, key performance indicators, Correct. right? You say they're tracking yes. in the wrong direction. So, Anne, when you look at that data, what concerns you the most uh, in terms mm -hmm. of where we're going in the wrong direction? Well, I think what concerns me and should concern everyone is that relative relative to the people to whom we compare ourselves, the countries around the world, we are going in the wrong direction. So for example, our uh, gross domestic product per capita, yes, small increase this year, which is okay, but in comparison to, say, the United States per capita, that gap is widening. I think it's something like $15,000 now. If you look at productivity per worker, uh, productivity in the United States is, I think, something like 3.5 times higher than that which you see in Canada per worker. That tells you that you're not seeing the economic productivity that you need to ensure ongoing prosperity okay, for so all why, Canadians. Why is that? I mean, when you GDP per capita, is that because there's more people retiring, boomers, populations getting older? What, what accounts for when that gap? When you work back from productivity and uh, GDP, um, there are lots of different factors, some of which you have identified. But if you look at what drives GDP, productivity, it is private sector investment investment in machines and equipment. And it's it too is low. it's too low. It's private sector uh, investment in intellectual property. It is private sector investment in adult education, mm. on the job learning. We trail so many other countries in terms of the on the job adult education that you see other countries providing so that their individual workers are more efficient. They're producing more per hour, not less. Yeah. Okay, so at least I heard Anne say private sector investment, private yeah. sector investment a bunch of times. So yeah. is this a call to action for the private sector or is this a policy solution that the government needs to, to, to enact to, to force the private sector or encourage the private sector? To well, do the that? answer is yes. Okay, all oh. of it. Yeah. Okay, it's yeah. all of it. So uh, business will say to you, the reason why we're not doing more in R&D is because of uh, having to make the case for investment in Canada, because a lot of times these are multi, big multinational corporations, uh, we just don't have a guarantee on how long it's going to take for our project. We're not getting as much return on it. And that's a policy fix in a lot of ways. Right. Um, but we also need to have the we have to have the companies be aware of the fact that Canada is worthy of the investment and uh, complacency is not something that we should actually be encouraging as time goes by because it's going to have a major impact on the long term future of this country. Do you think the private sector in this country is too complacent on, on investment? I, I, I've heard this yeah. criticism yeah. over the years that they, they'd rather you know uh, send money out to shareholders and, and juice dividends rather than mm -hmm. reinvest in productivity and expansion or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it, what's your sense? It's not what I I think it's what I see, see in the mm. data. And if you take a look at how we compared to R&D in the United States, in Japan, in the UK, it yeah. is starkly yeah. different, like three and a half times lower than Japan, significantly different mm. than in, in, the, in the UK and in the United States. So I don't need to have a feeling about whether Canadian companies are doing it. I see the metric that Canadian companies 
are not investing in R&D like the rest of the world is. And that does have an impact on GDP per capita. That has an impact on what we can actually purchase in our country. Okay, so and Lisa mentioned things like the regulatory regime needs mm -hmm. to change. I know major projects, especially if you're going to do critical mm -hmm. minerals and these right. things, people want yeah. it to move fast. Is that one thing that encourages this, speeds it up? What, what are the other things they could look at as a government? Well, first of all, that, I think, is the number one thing people mm -hmm. need to look at, right? Mm -hmm. uh, wherever you go in the world where you're seeking foreign investment into Canada, the question people ask is, well, can you get anything built, right? That's a pretty scary question, David, uh, and investors expect a return on uh, their investment. So regulatory uh, reform yeah. uh, absolutely uh, is key to our ability to uh, get projects up and running in a timely fashion. I, I think uh, other things in terms of the economy, just overall talking about the private sector and helping Canadians understand that making a profit and being successful and being a Canadian champion is a good it's thing. A good thing. It, we should be talking about it. We yeah. should be proud of our private sector. And we don't seem to see that conversation that a lot in this country. That is not the political conversation now. It's no. all about gouging grocery stores and yeah. big telecoms and banks right. and windfall. I, I, I mean, but there, there, there's a reason people are feeling that way about of corporate Of course. Canada, right? Well, well, yes, there is, but uh, the reason is largely beyond the control of any one government, right? Mm -hmm. um, inflation is a global um, factor. The war in Ukraine, the war in the Middle East, those are global factors that have led to, in large part, the affordability crisis, right? Global supply chains disrupted. All of it drives inflation up, causes the banks, central banks, to move in and increase interest rates. Actually, that is beyond the control of any one government. Then you have to talk about how do you protect your citizens and your private sector against those events. And you've seen the government try and do that through a, a number of programs. I think we can talk about how effective some of them have been. But uh, it, it seems to me that, yes, the conversation is, oh, companies are making too much money, uh, making too many profits. But in fact, if you look at other countries, countries are proud yeah. of their global leaders. They talk about them. Young people want to go and work there. Um, and somehow we've lost that conversation. Mm -hmm. We used to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. We, uh, I remember my former boss, Mr. Kretchen, how, how proud was he of the can-do reactor as a technology and talking about it around the world? Well, people seem to have lost that yeah. desire to talk about the things we're good at. Well, does wedge politics maybe plays a role in this <laughs> and simplistic reduction of, you know, complex issues, you know, to, to create attack yeah. points. And it, it, it changes the understanding and the conversation mm, of the challenge. But, you know, Lisa, one of the things the government has tried to do is encourage investment into clean tech and the transition. Right. And you're sounding an alarm here that it, it's really been stalled, investment yeah. in clean tech. Um, th thank you for bringing it up because that is a really big concern. That can be fixed. It's been over 500 days since ITCs, the income tax tax credits, yep. were actually promised. Uh, they're still not uh, been proclaimed yet. They're not, uh, they're not in place, and companies are just waiting for it. The United mm -hmm. States, however, they're way far down the road, and they're attracting the industries and the innovation. And, you know, in terms of the, the bigger problem in all of this, the bigger problem is, like, I'm so glad you mentioned, Anne, about pride. You know, we've got a generation out there who want to work in Canada, are having a difficult time finding a job, but they're losing faith in actually what it is that Canada can do for them. And we had a Nick Manos survey that we commissioned, mm -hmm. and we take a look. He took a look at you know whether or not we're going in the right direction when it comes to increasing Canadian standard of living, and the result was stunning. And he was he was actually surprised by it because one would think that youth is optimistic, and the older we get, <laughs> we're not as optimistic. And it's completely the reversal. Yeah. If you ask this to 18 to 34 year olds, 63.6% .6 of them say that we're going in the wrong direction when it comes to increasing high standard of living. How do you keep those kids in Canada and not be attracted to cheaper houses and better jobs in the United States if we don't get our act together here? It's a challenge for the rich Western countries that each generation did better than mm -hmm. the generation before yeah. because we could build up from low bases. And we've gotten to a point where the base of, is so high. When you get population shifts and cost shifts like mm -hmm. annual you outlined, 
the, I'm not surprised 18 to 34 year olds are, are pessimistic when you look no. at where wages are, where mm -hmm. job yeah. security is, where pensions are, and where the ability to yeah. buy a house yes. is. Yeah. And that seems to be uh, the number one thing potentially driving. And this year we took a look at housing, yeah. Yeah. although the, you're the expert in the housing because <laughs> another cross-partisan yeah. panel Lisa yeah. was involved yeah. in came up with I think, one. I think we talked about that on this show. 140 yeah, we did. recommendations <laughs> we did, we did. in relation to housing. But you're right, and it's, it's not only for young people about owning a house. We met yeah. with 80 students yesterday, yeah. David, at the Telfer School of Management at the University of Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Those are young people. They're not looking at buying a house at this stage. They are trying to figure out how they pay the rent yeah. uh, for an apartment. They're sharing with two or three other people and they were, are working 40 hours a week in some cases as well as going to school and they still may have to access the food bank at the University of Ottawa. So. I think it's not surprising that Nick's numbers show that that generation, yeah. um, at, at least a certain chunk of that generation, are feeling very pessimistic and rightly yeah. so about what their future might hold for them. So, so when you look at all of this, yeah. uh, we've got a federal budget coming up April 16th. Yeah. If there's one thing you'd like to see from Christian Freeland, I know the, the tax credits or something, they've promised retroactivity on that, yeah. but we don't yet know when the precision and the clarity will come. What's the one thing you'd like to see from the finance minister in this budget? So, I mean, I, I just want to see something that's going to start moving economic development. For me personally, it's Indigenous uh, equity uh, loan guarantees. Yeah. Which they promised in the fall economic mm -hmm. statement. I think we'd oh, see some clarity I on I feel that very comfortable yeah. that it's going to happen, and I think that's a really good first step mm -hmm. in getting things done. What about you, Anne? Just uh, what would be one thing from you? I think it was two budgets ago they promised to look at regulatory reform mm. and look at the current system, look for efficiencies and make it more effective. I would love to see some concrete direction, some, some, something that goes beyond nice words and tells the private sector that this is the regime that we will have to meet right. in developing our yeah. project, whatever it is. A specific. Yes. A David, if I could, just one last yep. thing. Ann and I started this endeavor in 2021, and at the time we said, we have to act now to have a long-term growth plan because we can't afford to wait for a crisis. What the Nick Nano survey tells us is our kids between 18 and 34, they are in a crisis. That's why it's fragile. That's why we need to act now. Okay. All right. We're going to end it there. Uh, Lisa Raitt and McClellan, co-chairs of the Coalition for a Better Future. Thanks for your time. Thank you.